Praise the Lord. Before we begin, uh, I know that some people just walked in this morning. I just wanted to convey what Pastor uh, announced that uh, uh, Ben John's uh, father-in-law passed away. Um, Sheba's dad passed away uh, just a short time ago. Um, and um, both the, the family needs to get visa and uh, get, go through all that process, go to Houston and whatnot to get all that in time to make it to take care of the matters in India. So, um, you know, one thing I know when we, we come before in the presence of God uh, in moments like this, it is hard to focus. It is hard to think about any, anything else. Uh, but one thing that reminds me over and over again is when Jesus said a hard word, a uh, hard teaching, um, the, then the disciples started falling off one by one. Jesus asked the rest of the disciples, are you going to leave also? And uh, I believe Peter said, you know, where can we go? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. So even when hard times come, even when challenges come, even when struggles come, we are people of the word of God. We are people of the word. We run to the word because where else can we go? In this life of hopelessness, in this life of chaos and brokenness, where else can we go? but to the Word of God. Let us pray for this family. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace, Lord. We lift up Benjamin, Sheba, her her siblings, uh, the whole family in your mighty hands, O Lord God. As they're going through this time of grief, O Lord, we pray, O God, the comforting presence of the Holy Spirit will be with them right now, O Lord. As, O God, they're trying to plan everything uh, in a short time to get the visa and and take care of the kids. God, there's a lot that's going on. I know, God, uh, just uh, in their household, I just pray for peace. I pray for wisdom. I pray for comfort, O God, as they grieve and as they're shocked, O God, as they are saddened. I pray, Lord, you also give them comfort and peace in their heart supernatural strength in this time get, open up the doors for them oh lord so they can travel to india that's uh, i pray that all the different things will come in their favor so that they can serve their family oh lord we give you all the praise glory and honor in jesus name amen amen, amen. Uh, let us turn to galatians chapter 5 16 through 24 Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 24. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, and divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with their passions and desires. So we're continuing in the series in the New and Living Way. Uh, The last six weeks uh, we've been covering from this topic, and then we have seven subtopics uh, as we can see on the screen here shortly, we have seven uh, subtopics we've been covering in a systematic manner. Now, the truth is that God is performing his great work of redemption and restoration in us, and he'll, he'll bring it into completion in the day of Christ. And that's what we can see as we are going to walk through the series from new birth to the new heavens and the new earth. There is a process that he leads us through, and he brings about his life in all the circumstances and all the situations in our life. Uh, now, for the fa- last couple of weeks, we've been considering the subtopic, new fruit. And, you know, by being in fellowship with the Holy Spirit and, and walking in the Spirit, God is inviting us to produce fruit that replicates His own divine attributes in us. So, 
Just to put it simply, the fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. Now, it doesn't sound too complicated when I say that. But when you pause and realize it's that these, these nine qualities and these nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are divine, Spirit-driven attributes. These are the characteristics in, inbuilt of God Himself. And when we define each of these, these qualities, we have the tendency of sometimes defining in human terms. But we need to find the definition of each of these aspects in God Himself. So we need to look at how does Scripture describe God and how, how do we see the fruit of the Spirit ultimately shown through the ultimate revelation of God is through Jesus Christ. So His standard is our perfect standard when we go through these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And why, why do I say this? I say this because from a human perspective, if you look at these nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, we see unbelievers showing these characteristics as well. If you guys are going to go to the next slide, just to see, when you're looking at all these aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, the truth is we see unbelievers showing these characteristics as well. Sometimes even better than so-called Christians. That's not sad to say that. I want, I, that was the main thing that was driving me this morning is why is this the case? Now, I, I preface it by saying, when, I th- think, when we think about love, we need to define it the way God defines it, right? But I'm saying in a human perspective, when we think about love, there's oftentimes a disconnect between children of God and how they show love and how an unbeliever from their own natural self can show love. And it often seems more than Christian love. I, and I don't know why that is. I have a guess, but um, that, that's just the reality of and when we see patience, kindness, and goodness, oftentimes we see it shown more outside of the walls of the church. So I, I believe it comes down to this thought that we have this thought that good works, since good works don't count for salvation, then it's not ultimately expected out of us. We're saved by faith, saved by grace through faith. No good works. It's almost like we don't need to do good works. I just need to have this this confession that I, am a believe, I believe in Jesus Christ and that is all that is expected of me, I don't have to do any, I don't have to show or any evidence of my salvation. And, and this is no wonder that we have an increasing number of people that, you know, that believe that you don't have to be a Christian. I, 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 and, you know, when you talk to people that are disillusioned with the church, you find this, that, you know what, I, I'm, I've been to church, the people in the church are not showing any of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, is that a kind statement? No, it's, it's a very generalized statement, to be fair. But this, this whole thing it, it is causing a lot of people to ask, what is, it, what, is any, what, what, what is the difference, really, in being in church or outside the church? If you talk to some people in the church, they, they might even say these statements, like, you know what, uh, I, you know, all this hand-raising and faith, all that is great, but you just need to be a good person. Just be a good person, you know. Not everybody's perfect. You hear that a lot, right? right? Just, you know, everybody's going to be perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We just need to do our best. You know, that is the standard that is placed. Or, you know, be the best version of yourself. You know, that's another thing that we hear nowadays. And the, the, it all comes down from this, is that human beings are able to show some amount of a characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit from the soul level itself. And that is, that is why people practically look at it and say, I can come up with these things on my own. I don't need to go to church. I don't need uh, the Bible. I don't need to, you know, I don't need this Holy Spirit even. You know, if people really are honest, they would say that. But that is why I, I'm going back to saying we need to define these things as God defines it. No, if you if you put the, the any person in the right circumstances, you have great parents. You know, if you have a, a right state, it's the right frame of mind. If you give them some motivation, like, hey, if you do good, you're gonna get good back. If you do good, you're gonna be successful. If you give these motivation, like you can earn karma. You know, 
You can strain out positive qualities because the, all they're thinking at the end of the day is the bottom line. What do I get out of this? And they will show all these things to some extent uh, back to you. And this is why we need to come against that teaching and to show that as children of God bought by the precious blood of Christ, the standard to which God holds us is to Him Himself. He is the definition. He is the standard to Him. He is, the, he is our righteousness. He is the standard to which we are held. And He is perfection in all these aspects. Now, when we the, today I'm going to talk about the middle three of these, uh, these things. And I'm going to be fairly quick with them because of the lack of time due to things that have happened this morning. Three aspects that we'll talk about today is patience, kindness, and, and goodness. And as you can see there, we, last week we talked about love, joy, peace. It is more internal, but also you can, you, can, you can describe these all as somewhat external and internal and all that. But mostly we're exposed in the context of our families, in churches, in our workplaces, in, in any communal circumstance. We're exposed in those middle three things, patience, kindness, and goodness. In fact, I believe others can define your patience, your kindness, your goodness better than you can yourself because we have always the tendency of over being, we're, we're so kind to ourselves. We're so generous to ourselves in, in grading ourselves in our you know, patience, kindness, and goodness. And what we'll do today quickly is... Uh, We'll define how God defines it, and we will talk about some real issues in, in how we put this into practice and where we are lacking. So let's go to patience. And the word patience in, in Greek, literally, it, it consists of two words, long and, and temperance, so long or suffering. And so that in some versions of the Bible, you read long suffering. You know? this, is, um, this, is a, this is a state of peace, okay? And so that ties into what we talked about last week. It's a state of peace, the knowing that not everything is in your control. That, that the, this world is broken, fundamentally broken. This world is not our home. That, but then at the same time, God has everything under control. And, and, and so nothing happens to me, nothing that happens to me is an accident. You know, God is fully aware of what happens in my life. And so... That knowledge of God's sovereignty and His control and a peace in Him leads me to be patient and long-suffering. Hallelujah. A couple of examples. Let me just quickly, you guys know the scripture really well. Patience of Christ is what shines to me as an example. For 30 years, He was submitted to His parents. 30 years. Being the God-man. Submitted to His parents. Obedient, fully obedient. He waited for his time. He waited for his hour. Just imagine the, the amount of work he could have done in all those 30 years from an infant onward. There could have been stories of legends of Jesus the infant healing the sick. or you know, Just imagine the, the, the countless things that Jesus could have done. But he waited patiently for his time. And we see it when he starts his ministry. It's almost like the clock is on. Three and a half years of ministry, does a lot of good, goes across all of Judea. His ministry is limited as well. See patience there too. Could, could, could Jesus had a worldwide ministry? Of course. Within a moment's notice. He could have stayed here forever as well. But what do we see here? He knew exactly what his purpose was for. Three and a half years. He always talked about that one day. One day that he will have to give up his life. So we see his patience through the cross, the garden of Gethsemane, and, and so on and so forth. Because my time is racing forward, I, um, let me just point out to you a couple of areas where we lack patience. When, when we lack patience in waiting for God's time. I, I, in fact, I have a lot of things to say. It's often not us, and I'm talking to younger people this moment. It's not often, not, not often us. It's really the forces around us that are, make us more impatient. So oftentimes parents, I love you all. I'm a parent myself. Parents are the source of impatience. It often frustrates people who 
are trying to be patient in the Lord when they get pressure from their parents to do certain things. Community, we're all faultless, faultless well. We need to recognize the patience. We need to build up a patience in each and every single one of them to recognize God's timing, whatever it may be. I'm going to leave it there. You guys know what I'm, where I'm going with that. Second is kindness. Kindness, the kindness here is a, is a, a, a kindness that has real impact on others. A, a, a deep awareness that we ourselves are, are recipients of the kindness of God. And people desire, desire to be felt, uh, desire to receive kindness. We, we all want to be, you know, we all want to receive kindness, right? Like from our bosses or from people in our life. You know, if we do something wrong, if we say, hey, I'm sorry, you expect a certain level of kindness in return saying, that hurt me, but I forgive you, you know. Uh, we, we expect kindness in return. How do, how do we see God's kindness? Romans 2, 4. Do you perceive, presume the riches of, his, riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance? His kindness is not meant to lead us into rebellion, not lead us into doing whatever we like. It's meant to lead us into repentance because God ultimately can do anything that he desires to do. He's a just judge but he is showing extra kindness towards us so that he gives us time in this era of grace so that we will repent of our sins and come back to him. Now, how does this lead, lead to us? Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And this goes back to that definition of kindness, is awareness that we are the recipients of, of this kindness from Christ. If we have received so much kindness for our sin that, that we could never pay for, why are we punishing others for sins that are, that, that are not anywhere near the kind of sin that we have committed against God? The Jesus, the story of Jesus caught in, uh, the, caught Jesus, uh, how Jesus treated the woman who was caught in adultery. You guys all know the story. I'm just pointing to you that where you see the kindness of Christ in that moment in that woman's life, where Jesus was the only one who could have put her to death and uh, executed judgment, but he did not. Lastly, goodness. Goodness is a moral, ethical excellence. Leading, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a kind of innocence. It's an inclination to always pour out, always give, always share, always help. We often describe, you know, the, out of the goodness of the heart, this person did something, right? It, it is a, that, that's the quality of goodness, that you're, you're willing to give it all. God is so good, right? And that is how we define God's goodness over and over again. We see in the Psalms and other scripture portions. He's characterized as being good. God is good. He is so good that he gave his only begotten son for us. That's how good God is. The rich young ruler from Jesus' life, Jesus, uh, the Gospels, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus saying, Hey, good teacher, how, how must I, what must I do to attain, uh, you know, attain eternal life? And Jesus knew how the rich young ruler defined goodness, so he asked him, Who, who do you call good? Who is good but God alone? He is not, Jesus was not saying that he, wasn't, he himself wasn't good, but he was trying to challenge the rich young ruler's assumption of what is good. And that is the problem that sometimes we have. We think, everybody thinks they're good. I'm a good person. Everybody defines themselves as, as good. But again, we need to come back to a definition of God. That's what Jesus pointed and said, who is good but God alone? Who is good but God alone? Psalm 16, 2. You are my Lord, and apart from you, I have no good thing. And this is the, this is the crux of the matter. When we understand and intros, have introspection inside, we will realize how much we lack in real goodness because all of our intentions are skewed. We have a lot of selfish intentions. And in that bankruptcy, in that poorness of spirit, we ought to cry out, Lord, apart from you, I have no good thing. Anything good that I, I do, it's from you. It, you are good. Apostle Paul often says, you know, full of goodness. You know, full of goodness. I mean, it's, it's an act of filling. If he fills us with this goodness, 
It should be to a point where if someone cuts us, we bleed in goodness, you know? Like, th- this is where we ought to be. Now, now we, we can't achieve moral perfection, but I think there should ought to be a desire in each one of us to strive to be good from the inside out, from our intentions, not just doing good, but intentions on out. I invite the worship team to come forward. You know, when we think about these three qualities of the Spirit, uh, fruit of the Spirit, oftentimes this is most tested in the context of the four walls of our home. In fact, when I was in, you know, early in the faith, I, I was thoroughly convinced I was a very fruitful tree with good fruit until I got married. And then I thought I got that figured out, and then I had kids. And you understand time and time again that you have a lot to grow. You have a lot of, a lot of growth needed, and God brings for people in your life. You cannot avoid people. This is the beauty of God. Even this community that we have in this church, it's a, mo- it's a way for God to show us our imperfections and how much we need Him. And, and, you know, whether it's at home, your hypocrisy, your shortcomings are shown. You can, there's only so much you can do to act in front of people. At home, this is why there's, there's sometimes a little more tension at home. Because we're ourselves. And, and that ought to be, that mirror ought to show to us, there's something lacking within me. This, this strife that is coming out of me, this anger that is coming out of me, this, 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 this impatience that is coming out of me, the, 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 the short temper that I have towards only family members, not to anybody outside. Because, again, we have, we are more, we're very decent outside. At home, though, this is where God is pointing to us and saying, stop blaming others. Look at your own heart and see the bankruptcy in each of our hearts, and cry out to the Lord, cry out to the Lord for his, more of His Spirit so that the fruit of the Spirit can come in fullness. Hallelujah. May His name be glorified. Amen.